How's it going everyone? I know you love generics and the last two videos got so much hype that I just had to make a third video on generics. But that's it. No matter how much you beg for more generics, this will be the final video. For now. In today's lesson, we're going to learn how we can use generics in method definitions. To get started, we will create a struct that holds the coordinates for a point. So here we'll type in struct point, which will be a generic type. And inside here, we'll type in x of type t and y of type t. Next, let's create that implementation block and include the generic type of t and the points with the generic type of t. Here, we're telling Rust that we want to implement the generic type on our methods. Then we can use the generic type inside our implementation block. For this example, we're going to try to get some coordinates back. So function coordinates, which will take a reference to self and return to us a tuple with the first coordinate and the second coordinate. Then inside, all we have to do is return that tuple by typing in ampersand self x and a reference to y. And just like that, we can now create two points, one called p1, which will equal a point with x being set to one and y being set to two. And a second point where x will be set to 1.5 and two will be set to 2.0. So now that we have two points that use generic types, let's try to use the method we just created, which also uses a generic type. So right below, we're going to debug or just print p one dot coordinates. And we're going to do the same thing for P2. Now, when we run this, what we should get as an output are our coordinates in integer format or I32 format and the coordinates in F64 format. So we were able to use both of those types independently with a single struct and a single implementation block. If you want to specify constraints, you just have to type in the data type that you want to specifically create a method for in your implementation block. So what we're going to do next is include a new implementation block, which will take the point, and this will only work with I32. So to demonstrate this, I will pass in an I32 method, which is just a random name, or not really a random name, but it shows you that this belongs to the I32 type. And inside here, we will print line this is only visible for i32. Then we can go back up to our main function. And if we were to type in p1, we would be able to refer to the i32 method because it's an i32. If we refer to p2, that method will not be available for floats or any other type. This method is only available for i32. So that's how you can specify a constraint. Finally, it's important to cover that you can have multiple layers of generics in an implementation block. For example, using the struct we had from earlier, let's create a new implementation block. Here we're going to type in impl, use t as a generic type, and create our point with the generic type once again. Then inside here, we're going to create a method which allows us to label our data. So we will call this label. And we're going to include a new generic type, which I will just abbreviate to L for label. Now, as an argument, it's going to take self and the type of the label. Then it's going to return to us a tuple with the label, the first coordinate, and the second coordinate. And finally, we just need to return the label, the first coordinate, and the second coordinate. As you can see, we were able to use generics within the implementation block. And these generics are completely separate from the generics we defined for our struct. Now, what we're going to do is create a new variable called p1, and I keep on forgetting this is not Python, equal point.label. And we might as well just change this to point with label. And inside here, we can pass in a label which we can call coordinates. Now, the type of the argument is going to be a string slice. Because it was generic, we can now include anything as a label. We can even use 10 as a label or a Boolean as a label. We can use whatever label we like. For this example, I will leave it as the string slice of coordinates. And when we print this point with label, what we should get as an output is this data over here. A tuple which contains the label, the first coordinate and the second coordinate. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
You can't believe this is the final lesson on generics, and I feel your pain. But I also know what else you're thinking. You're thinking about the runtime cost when using generic type parameters in your code. The good news is that generics won't make your program run any slower than if you were to use concrete types like I32 or F64. Rust accomplishes this by performing monomorphization of the code at compile time, which is a fancy schmancy term for turning the generic code into specific code by filling in the generic types with concrete types at compile time. For example, here we could create a function called print because I miss Python already, and this will implement the display trait. Now we're going to pass in an argument of type T, and all we're going to do is print line and print that argument. So it's practically a print clone for the print function that we have in Python. Now we can go up here and use it. We can pass in, I feel like I'm coding in Python now. Or we can pass in an I32 such as 42. When we run this, what we should get as an output are both of the arguments being printed to the console. When we include the following lines of code in our project, Rust will create two functions at compile time because it knows that these will be the only types used with this generic function. So it's going to create function print argument of type string, and it's going to create function print argument of type i32. And that's it. It's not going to create the other types because we're not using i64 and we're not using a u8. So there's no point in generating that code. It's only going to create the variations that we're using in the code. 